Did you ever wonder if there's a different way to live life? This is the story of 23 people who did. 23 people who found an answer to that question in the mountains. 23 climbing buddies who made a choice to shape their lives around what they loved, which led to a simple idea, to build a business around a life outside. And because they loved mountains more than money, they formed a co-op. So what is a co-op exactly? It starts with you. Because a co-op is made up of members, in our case, millions of members. Members who come together for a common cause. Members who are actually owners and have a voice in what we do. Members who share in the co-op's profits and choose to give and get back every year. Because when you spend a dollar at REI, you're investing in the outdoors and helping people get outside. Bottom line, a co-op is a business that puts purpose before profits. And more than seven decades later, we're still proudly a co-op. We're still happily searching the world for the best gear we can find. And we're still in it together, but with slightly more than 23 friends. Most importantly, we're still driven by the belief that it's in the wild, untamed, and natural spaces that we find our best selves. So if you're still wondering if there's a different way to live life, we think there is. Join us. Okay. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual member meeting of the co-op. To go from 23 friends to 17 million is pretty awesome. So I'm Wilma Wallace, and I'm the general counsel and corporate secretary of REI. I'm actually new to this role, but I've been a member of REI for 30 years, and I think, I think I signed up um, to become a member at the old Capitol um, Hill store. So REI, um, while new to me, um, and after having just joined here in October, has been a part of my life for many, many years. So I want to thank you all for coming here tonight, and we're here because of each of you and the 17, 16 plus million other members um, of the co-op. Your participation is what makes the co-op special. Um, I'd like to first, before um, we go through the agenda for the night, and I'll be quick about it, is I'd like to be able to introduce you to our board of directors. So I'm gonna ask the board of directors, most of whom are in the front row, to please stand and um, be acknowledged. So thank you for your service. And leadership team that's scattered throughout, you're not off the hook. So if you could please stand up and um, also acknowledge uh, the membership that's here. So what are we gonna do today? Um, first, we're going to hear from our board chair, Steve Hooper, and I'll introduce him to the stage in a moment. And he's gonna share his reflections um, of membership. He's been a long time member, I think 45 years or so, um, of REI, and he's going to take us through some governance matters that we're obligated to go through as a part of the um, bylaws, subject to the co-op bylaws. Um, but that will be relatively quick. After Steve, you're gonna hear a business update from our president and CEO, Jerry Stritsky, and various leadership team members who will walk you through some of the work that we've been engaged in um, last year and are looking forward to for 2018. Um, and then we'll uh, pause and take Q&A, and after that, we'll close. So again, thank you all for taking the time to be here. I know many of you traveled from um, relatively long distances, and we really do appreciate uh, your participation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Hooper. Thank you, Wilma. <clears throat> it's a real honor and pleasure to be up here again this year. You know, if somebody would have told me 45 years ago when I paid that $1 to become a member of REI at your Capitol Hill store, I, that I would be standing here today, I told them I don't think that would have been possible, but it is a real honor to be here representing uh, your board of directors. Um, you know, membership is a really, really powerful thing, especially when you have 17 million members all interested in doing the same thing. 
You know, this spring, REI started something that I think is really special. They started to talk about membership through the eyes of members, and they started putting their stories online. And I don't know if you've read any of them, but I would encourage you to do that. Because, did he, did he put it up already? Oh, you stole my, let me control the thing, okay? Anyway. Um, the stories are amazing. Some of them actually made me cry. Some of them made me smile. But all of them inspired me to continue to do things outdoors. Now, I want you to meet Ibra Ruha. He is an amazing young man from Senegal, Africa. He moved to this country in 2007. And he moved to New York City. He meant he coming from the western piece of Africa and moving to New York City. What a culture shock that would have been. In 2014, a good friend of him asked him to go hiking. It was a spring hike. But you know what happened in New York this year in the spring, it snowed all the time. So sure enough, just before their hike, it snowed. So he and his buddy were out there hiking in knee-high snow. But he loved it. He said it changed him. It transformed him. He said he had more self-confidence by being out there than he ever thought he could. I like this story because it reminds me of another transformation that I had a chance to witness. And it's transformation of my son when he was 12 years old. He's a Boy Scout. The scout leader's gonna take him camping and we're getting ready for our 50 mile hike. We're gonna go to the Saw Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. So the first thing I did, we went to REI and I bought him all his gear. This is my son's very first why parents keep this stuff that they bought their kids long ago, I don't know. But it was in the garage, I brought it here. We had to amend the pack because it didn't fit. He didn't have any hips, he still didn't have any hips. So I made it fit, and so we began the hike. And we prepared the boys, we thought, they were 12, 13, 14 years old, for what they were going to encounter practice, hiked on the trails, we did everything we could, but after the first day, <laughs> I was worried that we weren't going to make it. This is Stephen, halfway through the first day, just wiped out. But I gotta tell you, by the middle of the second day, he was a different person. All the boys were. They had been transformed. By the end of that five days, they weren't hiking the trails, they were running the trails. So I got to see firsthand what it did to a young boy and the confidence he gave him. I can't tell you today if that confidence that he has came just from that, but I can tell you he's highly confident, he's self-reliant, and he now is taking his two little girls outdoors for the same reason that his father took him. Now, when Wilma introduced me, she introduced me as the chair of the board. So here is your board. And what does a board of directors of REI and a co-op do? Well, the primary thing we do is we get to hire and evaluate the CEO. We just went through that evaluation process and he came through in flying colors. We're also very responsible for making sure that the co-op's around for our grandchildren's grandchildren. We have to make sure that the mission and the values of the co-op continue to exist. We approve the budgets, and we also determine how the profits are split. How much we give out to the members based on the bylaws, how much we give to charities, and how much we give back to the employees who make it all happen, the 12,000 folks who make the co-op exist. Now, how do you get to be on the board of directors? A lot of people ask us that question. Uh, we have a nomination and governance committee, and their job is to, every year, kind of identify what are the needs of the co-op? What do we need to be doing in order to make sure that we are helping Jerry and his team be successful? We do a job description for the next board member. And then we begin a very ex exhaustive search with an outside firm. The first people we look at are the folks who self-nominate. We have a self-nominating process in the summer, and if you're interested, you run through that process, and we compare the skills of those people to the skills that we're looking for. We also look outside, trying to find the best people we can. If, in fact, we make it through that process, you then get put before the membership to be voted on as a board member, and you get to serve a three-year term. And you can be 
run for re-election if you're interested, but the maximum number of years you can serve is 12 on the board. And we do that very purposefully because we want continuity. You don't want people changing all the time, but we also want the opportunity to bring in new people every year. This year we had four folks slated for re-election onto the board. Uh, they all passed. 1.54% of our active members participated in the vote. It's the highest number we've had in about five years. Uh, about three years ago, we changed from a paper process to an electronic, just so we could save on the paper and the postage and all that good stuff. But they were reelected for another three-year term. First person is Beth. Beth is an executive in a uh, pharmacy company. Uh, Beth is an active outdoor person. She may look really, really nice, but don't get her on a mountain bike, don't get her in a kayak and think you're gonna beat Beth in any of those things. She's very, very active. And she loves the fact that the co-op has most recently really focused a lot of their efforts on women and girls in the outdoors. She has daughters of her own. Next is Chris Carr. Chris uh, comes to us from a very large food and beverage company. Uh, great experience that is adding great value to the co-op. Chris is an amazing athlete. He can do just about anything he wants to do. Um, we did get him out on a mountain bike last year, and he, I think we learned that there's a few things he needs to practice on a little bit more. His mountain biking is a little bit different than what Chris is used to doing. Next we have Matt Compton. Matt is a technology executive and venture investor. Matt has a great, great background in digital marketing and technology and whatnot, which is really important for the co-op right now, especially as you start to move more into a digital format. Matt is also an awesome this guy can hang on to rocks that just nobody on the human planet should be able to hang on to. He's inspirational to watch. And next we have Steve Lockhart. Steve is a chief medical officer for a large healthcare provider in the country. Um, he has a real passion for the outdoors and for making sure that people who don't have the opportunity to get into the outdoors get into the outdoors. Steve is also an amazing climber and he loves to hike. And he loves to tell stories. I think one board meeting, he brought back pictures for the board meeting to watch us and his daughter on one of their hikes. So he loves to get outdoors and participate in, in that activity. We do have some official business that we have to do tonight. At this meeting, we have to approve the minutes from last year's meeting. So when you came in, hopefully you picked up this piece of paper and it's a copy of the minutes from last meeting. And to approve it, using Robert's Rules of Order, I need somebody to make a motion that we approve the minutes for last year's meeting. Is there someone in the audience who would be willing to do that? I need a second. Is there a second out there? Okay, it's been approved and, and seconded that we approve the minutes. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it, so the minutes are approved. So that's the end of the official business. Now we get to uh, talk about, isn't that fun how quickly that goes? Now we get to talk about the real aspect and what the co-op has been doing. Before I hand it over to Jerry, there's just one other piece of news I wanted to share with you. Now, we are a national co-op now. So we are considering the opportunity of maybe moving the member meeting to some other location next year, just so we can expose other members around the country to this process. Haven't made that decision yet, but we are looking into it, and as soon as we know, we'll let all members know so that they can hopefully attend at that place as well. It is now my honor and privilege to bring up the individual who's leading this great organization, Mr. Jerry Stritsky. So. Steve, thank you for telling me uh, or sharing the great story about your son. Um, I looked like that about a week ago. I was up on the trail by myself, though. I want to tell a different story and kind of start our business kickoff. I'm going to bring a number of people up to kind of give more details, but um, we've, uh, we're about to celebrate uh, our 80th year celebration. Um, we actually recently have been looking at retail and what's going on, the trends of retail. And as a part of that exercise, we went back and looked to see who was doing retail 180 years ago. And there's none of them left. Um, you know, the idea that you can survive 80 years, that you can stay relevant, that you can um, do what it takes to kind of be compelling is tough. And 
I've thought hard about that, and as I think about this group of people, there's a couple stories that really stand out at me. If you, at one point in time, one of our earliest retail stores, I think it was after the gas station shelf, which was the first place that we had product, but the second one was on a second floor next to the room where the Mountaineers met, there was an REI store. And so you could you know, shut down the Mountaineer room, walk down the hall, walk in another door. I understand it was more like a big closet, uh, but that's where REI operated out of. Uh, there was this phenomenal sense of community, a group of people that were doing life together and doing life outside together. And as you read the early stories of REI and the history, uh, people met their spouses, they took their families out together. There was this phenomenal sense of community. And I think that theme really resonates today, and I think it's why the co-op has thrived for so long. This idea of a love for and a passion um, for a life lived outside. As you might imagine, uh, that's changed a little bit since 1938. Um, however, I will share with you that I do believe that passion and that commitment to a life outdoors is still alive and vibrant and well. Rumor has it those are, are uh, we tried to look real close to see if those are beer cans, but we're just not uh, sure. Um, I'm a little suspicious, but we're just, we just can't confirm. The, I want to share a couple of facts uh, that I think are just amazing. Uh, last year, we added a million new members to the co-op. Uh, that's the lifeblood for the future of the co-op. Uh, as we bring new members into the co-op, uh, they really feed the future of the co-op, and they become really the basis for what keeps uh, the co-op healthy. The last four years, we measure carefully as we look at what's going on, uh, we look at the entire outdoor business, and we've actually been gaining market share. Uh, and it's a competitive retail environment out there. The idea that the co-op is gaining market share in, uh, in the selling of the outdoor gear and product, I think, is, is a sign of health. Um, this next stat I'm incredibly proud of. Since 1976, $86 million invested in literally thousands of nonprofits in the United States. I, yeah. I dare say there's not a trail in the United States that at some point in time REI has not been a part of either improving it, making it better, creating better access, and that is a legacy that is uh, just to be cherished. So that's uh, really impressive. Uh, we started this little thing two or three years ago called Opt Outside. Every year it's gotten bigger, and it's kind of one of those things that has its own momentum. This past year, 8.2 million moments shared in social media about opting outside as we closed our stores in Black Friday so our associates could go outside the day after Thanksgiving and be with their families. Another iconic moment that I'm proud of. Um, another interesting thing this year, we had, we, it was a big conversation about public lands and how important it is to keep public lands public, keep them in the hands, um, you know, not let them go back to states or re really run the risk of being sold into private hands, and kind of losing access to those. REI played a critical role in, in kind of facilitating that conversation, make sure it had good visibility, but most importantly, enabling people to kind of weigh in on that subject. Over three million Americans spoke up about our public lands. That's something that uh, we're incredibly proud of. Now, the, uh, the role that REI plays in getting people outside, I believe, is more important now than ever. And before we, I'm going to turn it over here, for, I think, for Ben Steele to come up. Before I do, I want to do a video that we put together recently that kind of highlights that. So Ben will come up and, and pick up the, the... Human beings are becoming the world's first indoor species. We spend 95% of our lives indoors. That's roughly 70 some years. In an office with a view of another office, behind windows that feel like walls. Doesn't sound so good, does it? Let's change that. Hi there, I'm Ben Steele. I'm a Chief Creative Officer here at the Co-op and I lead the teams, parts of the organization that are uh, really focused on engaging our membership and engaging the next generation of our membership. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we're doing across the Co-op to do just that. So that video uh, is something we take pretty seriously, that notion that uh, 
Something's changed. This notion of 95% of our lives uh, spent indoors is a big deal. Another stat that we talk about sometimes is that the average uh, school child in uh, the states today has less time outside than a prisoner or less time than a chicken on a chicken farm. So um, none of those things are good news stories to us. We, we don't think that's great, right? But what we really want to do is not decry the fact that that's where we're at. We want to talk about how do we change that? How do we light a passion inside of people to say, that's not how I want to live my life. I want to do something different. I want to fight for something different. So we talk about this idea of the path ahead. And the path ahead is a, a, a topic, a wide range of topics that we introduced last fall to really talk about the macro trends that are pushing people from the outdoors indoors, that are pushing us toward that notion of being an indoor species. And in doing so, engage people in the conversation to say, is that happening because you want it, or is it a passive choice and something that's happening as a result of some of the forces around us? So we really believe that, you know, uh, lots of positive things come from technology, from urbanization, from all these big macro forces, but unless we're conscious about the choices that we make as a result, the outcomes that happen look a lot like time indoors. So what we want to do is talk about how do we change that. And it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, maybe when you came into the store this evening or if you look over there, you'll see 95 helpful tips to help you spend a little bit of time outside, right? And the goal here is to help you understand, you hear 95% and you think, Wow, that's huge, there's nothing I can do about that. In fact, there's a ton that you can do about that. You can have lunch outside, right? You can choose to do something outside in a park instead of inside during the weekend. You can say, hey, it's raining, but it turns out there's a rain jacket, many available just outside these doors, I wanna point out. And if I put that on, I can actually spend some time outdoors. We wanna give people little ways to make that change. That change isn't gonna happen overnight, but it comes in inspiring people to make a different change, right? So we really wanna focus on how small choices can have a big impact. Ultimately, toward another big idea. We believe that really, in, in many ways, our calling is to awaken a lifelong love for the outdoors. And that is not happening in exactly the same way it did in the past. The generation that's now coming into adulthood, that's now coming into making decisions for themselves, doesn't have the same exposure to the outdoors as the generations before that. If we don't light that spark, if we don't awaken that love, you won't have the same investment. As Jerry talked about protecting national parks, protecting public lands, people who have spent time in public lands understand their importance and will fight to protect them. If people don't have that relationship, then those, that, that spirit, that energy goes away. So we really wanna talk about how do we get more people outdoors? Really, how do we enable and inspire them? And one of the things that we did was to stop and say, well, what's stopping people from getting outdoors? What are the barriers? Well, we can talk about it a ton, and we can talk about it as a group of people who actually spend a lot of time outdoors, or we can actually just ask them. Sometimes those barriers are big, sometimes they're small. This spring, we decided to ask them in a lighthearted way called, what's your butt? Bring us your butt. You've got one, we wanna hear it. We wanna help you solve it, right? So we asked members, we asked the, the, the public, what are your excuses, what are your reasons for not getting in the outdoors? And then we engaged them in real time in social, in our stores, in a conversation to say, you've got an actual barrier, here's an actual solution to it. Sometimes those things were huge and we'd point to nonprofit partners of ours and talk about ways in which we can fight a big idea. Sometimes it was pretty simple and uh, we'd just say, well again, there's a nice rain jacket for that rain or here's a trail near you that you could discover. We ended up engaging 22 million people in that conversation, which is pretty remarkable, right? Uh, and we helped them. Sometimes we gave them a product to help them. As I said, sometimes we gave them a reference or a referral to help them. We even gave one individual a trip to Iceland, which is a pretty good solution to a barrier. I wish I'd had that barrier. Um, you see an image there of uh, folks running at night. We also said, hey, you know what? It's cold right now, it's dark. It's the darkest time of the year across the country. Let's do something together. Let's have the no butts night run. So we partnered with Ragnar and we asked people to join us online and then we asked them to get outside and share that story. And 14,000 people, myself included, put on a headlamp and got out there, regardless of the weather, regardless of the dark, and said, you know, that's really not as big a barrier as I thought. Uh, we also did something that was really fun. We'd hear people's barriers, we'd hear their butts come in, and then we'd film a video in real time that night and the next morning have an answer for them. I want to share an example of what that looked like. Hey everyone, so Toby rode in and said, but my bike got stolen. I'm sorry to hear that, Toby, that is a bummer. But never fear, we're gonna send you a thousand dollar gift card towards one of these and one of these. It's pretty intense, I know. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. 
Toby got his bike, Toby got his bike lock, and a lot of people said, well, that's kind of cool. I've got a story I want to share, too. And those 22 million engagements are a real conversation. They're a conversation that says, hey, the thing that's holding you back isn't as big as you think. And no matter how big it is, there's somebody who's here to help. So when we think about enabling people, that also means how do we create actual moments in the outdoors that aren't just about an engagement in social or just about something happening in a store. And a lot of people don't realize this, but 400,000 people went into the outdoors last year with REI through classes and events and travel. And that's an amazing number, 400,000 people. And what we've done now is to say, how do we bring that even closer to the places that we play? So experience centers, where people can get on the mountain, get on the trail and do something in, with REI. So at Copper Mountain in Colorado, there's a new experience center. At a boathouse outside Atlanta. And we look and say, there's something real here. When this happens, when we're in the outdoors with someone, sharing that experience, lighting that passion, something amazing happens. We want to find more ways to do that and more places to do that. But it also sometimes means something as simple as, uh, I don't know how to find boots that fit me. Or, and this is one that I'll admit to, this is a safe space, um, there are many ways to tie your boots. Some of them are helpful, some of them are less helpful. Um, some of them are blister oriented, some of them less so. This, these pack fittings and boot fittings in store to really say to people, you don't have to have an uncomfortable backpack, you don't have to have uncomfortable boots, let's spend the time with you, we'll, we'll engage with you to have that conversation and make sure you walk out the door with the thing that's gonna make you have an awesome time in the outdoors. Um, 10,000 people joined us this spring to do just that, in store to have that conversation and to bring in either a boot they had or get one that day and say, I wanna make sure I'm getting the most out of this gear, I'm having the best experience that I can. So we're always thinking about how do we make that easier? How do we enable more folks to get out there? Uh, we've introduced a new, a new feature and a new offer from the co-op, which is this notion of, have you ever had that thing where you're trying to get out of town and you just forgot one thing and you're just on your way out and you're not sure where to go? Well, you can order online now you can swing by a store and you can get it that same day. And you can see whether it's in that store, and you can buy it and reserve it and pick it up and be ready to go. So whether that's about, I wanna get out on the trail and I need that one thing, or it's a case of, I just wanna be more convenient. I wanna be able to get in and out in a hurry. This notion of being able to buy and pick up that same day is something that we're excited about. I also talked about inspiration, right? Enablement's one thing, inspiration's another. We're really focused on how do we tell the stories of a life outdoors. And those aren't always the stories of the peak of top of the mountain achievement. They're the stories of how do people overcome those barriers? How do people find that love of the outdoors in their own lives? So films have been a big deal for us, right? Film and video storytelling has been a, a big focus for us. And that's everything from a 40 minute film called Paul's Boots uh, about a year, year and a half ago, which was the story of a community of people carrying the boots of a man who passed away before he could walk the Appalachian Trail, carrying them the whole length of the trail in his memory to uh, a slightly lighter toned video we have right now called uh, How to Run 100 Miles, which is one person getting essentially tricked into running 100 miles by their friend and then figuring out how the heck they were gonna do it. Um, you also see news and features. We really wanna make sure that we're building a daily habit with people, being the center of their life and the center of their outdoor life and the stories of the outdoor life. So we're really focused on how do we think about the co-op journal which is the place that we tell stories and, and, and share the news of the outdoors. How do we make sure that people go there first for the things that they need? So you see lots of features, lots of stories, lots of inspiring stuff and then informational stuff as well. And we're also looking uh, a lot at the power of podcasts. Uh, everybody here I, I'm sure has some relationship with a podcast in their life, which was a strange way to say that. That felt like it's a romantic relationship with a podcast, which I don't think it probably is. But we've got two podcasts that we love, Wild Ideas Worth Living and Take It From Me, and we're looking at how do we expand uh, into more podcast space and more audio storytelling. We're also looking for opportunities to get people together in a, in a bigger scale, right, and to really celebrate. And in Altessa, which is uh, an event that REI launched in 2017, well, in 2016, in the second annual Altessa retreat series brought a thousand women together to experience the outdoors and find community. From June to September, women pushed their limits, learned amazing skills, had great food, had amazing fellowship, told great stories, maybe had some wine, had, had a great time together in beautiful outdoor locations. And this year we're expanding that. There's gonna be two retreats, two one-day festivals, bringing the best of music and the outdoors together, uh, and a virtual join-in, something like that No Bucks Night Run that I mentioned. So the Squaw Valley event is sold out, but there is still avail availability at the Waterville Valley event, so if that's something that interests you, go look online and sign up. Uh, Altesse is an amazing experience. I know people in the room have been a part of it and, uh, say it's an incredible, incredible way to spend a weekend. We also love taking people to incredible places nearby and around the world. And the REI Adventures travel business 
uh, has 19 new women's adventures in Africa, Europe, Latin America, New Zealand, and North America. And in the last year has seen women's participation increase by 60%. We've also launched um, more intense trips for people who want a little bit more of a challenge. Intermediate mountain biking and advanced mountain biking for folks in the Grand Canyon, in Bryson and Whistler. And in 2018, we've added 30 new itineraries to put award-winning travel business in front of more folks to let more people experience a trip that maybe is, you know, like I said, close to home or a once-in-a-lifetime escape with REI. And we're really focused on how do we do that with next gen, with younger millennial customers, how do we have more offerings for women, and how do we also think about young families, giving them experiences that they can do together in the outdoors. As Steve showed, there's really no better time to light that, that love of the outdoors than with a young person, and uh, if we can help do that, all the better. All right, I got a lot of good stuff. I'm getting towards the end. I'll keep going here, though. We've got Member Jam. Member Jam was, uh, what happens if we throw a party at our stores? What happens if we basically celebrate membership with um, great stuff from campouts to uh, local cocktail making, which is a lot of fun. So we had 35 member coffee events in the last month where we gave away 18,000 cups of coffee, uh, celebrating and saying thank you to members. And we had these member jams in five stores that brought 4,500 people together throughout those stores. And in Boulder, they had a celebration of all things jam, basically just puns and wordplay that have to do with jam. So they had a blues band jam. They gave away 500 jars of jam. They hosted an in a jam survival campfire story session, a hand jamming clinic, and they played NBA Jam on a Nintendo Wii, which feels, to be honest, that one feels off base, but they were running out of jam things to do. Um, confidence is a huge part of enabling people in the outdoors as well. And expert advice has been a, a part of the co-op for two decades now. This notion of a source where people can go to answer questions, understand, progress, build knowledge, ultimately build confidence. It's what happens in our stores every day. But how does it also happen online? And expert advice is the way in which we do that. Um, expert advice has over 14 million people uh, participate with it last year, which you know puts it about the same size as back, uh, Backpacker or Gear Junkie, big outdoor storytelling and media publications. And last year, we relaunched expert advice with a new website that is easier for people to search. It's easier for people to link together progression and say, I'm beginning as an activity here. I want to progress through it. In the coming weeks, we'll be launching live Q&A. So if you have a question, you can go on and ask it, and an expert will help you get to an answer pretty quickly. We're excited about the way in which expert advice helps people build confidence in the outdoors so they can step into new spaces and new experiences. We also, I've talked a lot about that raincoat, so I'm going to talk specifically about it now, co-op brands, which is the expression of the co-op, you know, the, the, the product that we put our name on and very proud to do so. So we've, we've got some exciting stuff that happened this year. We updated the Half Dome tent, which is over there, which is the design team figured out a way to update our award-winning, classic, even better tent, and it's got more room, and it's even lighter, and all that good stuff, and it's very importantly, more sustainable. Sustainability is a huge part of what we do in co-op brands. Uh, that we're also this spring launching a partnership with Gore-Tex. So those rain jackets uh, that uh, have that co-op logo on them now also have the Gore-Tex logo as well and are even more trusted for, you know, great protection in inclement weather, which we know a lot about, although not today. So last but not least, uh, I'm going to echo what Jerry talked about in, out, in Opt Outside. And, you know, in three years, we've seen more than 15 million people participate and we've seen tens and tens of millions of shares, of stories, of photos, of videos. And what we're very excited about is that Opt Outside has become a part of the parlance of the outdoors. It's the way in which people talk about the choice to be outdoors, their expression of that passion, that awakened lifelong love. In many ways, it's people sharing their best days with us, with each other, with the community of membership of 17 million people saying, my best days are outdoors, I wanna share them with you, I wanna opt outside with you. We're incredibly excited about that and we continue to think about how do we use that story, that power, that call to action to help more people get into the outdoors. So I'm proud of all the stuff that we've done and that I got a chance to share, and we're able to do all of that because uh, the business of the co-op is healthy. And uh, I'm gonna invite Tracy Winbigler, our CFO, to come up and talk a little bit about that and share more. So, Tracy. Thanks, Ben. So I wanted to share my winter butt with everybody to get me going. Um, I said, oh, but it's icy out there. Oh, but it's muddy out there. But I tell you, if it had not been for my run club, uh, I probably would not be ready for spring running uh, this year. And it's really amazing the power of community. You know, that carpool that gets you out there, that companion who says, we're just going to get out there and go do it. 
Uh, and that's one of the things that I absolutely love about the co-op. Uh, it really brings the power of that community at an activity level, at a local level, and a national level. And that's really, we build that into our metrics of success in every measure that we have. The co-op is not just about making profits. The co-op is about being here for the long term. It's about a quadruple bottom line, focusing on our employees, our members, society, and business. And I'm glad to say that 2017 was a sustainable growth year in a very dynamic retail environment. Jerry shared some great examples already from market growth to community investment. So I'd like to spend a few minutes and share a few other highlights from 2017. Annual sales for 2017 were $2.62 billion. That was a 2.55% increase over 2016. We've seen strong digital growth. We were able to invest in retail pay. We were able to invest in technology to give our members a better experience when they come to our store, as well as some of the other amazing things that Ben just talked to you about. As part of our co-op structure, we reinvest 70% of our profits to our members and our employees and the entire outdoor community, including our non-for-profit partners. We invested $8.8 .8 million in over 1,000 outdoor places. We returned $196.3 million to our members in the form of dividends and credit card rebates, and $56.5 million to our employees for profit sharing and retirement. I also wanted to share a couple other really great milestones of being a great employer. Last week, we found out that we were on Forbes America's Best Employers List. We also, once again, are on the Fortune 100 Best Employers List, and we're one of the few companies that have been on that list since inception. It's a real testament to the great employees that we have here at REI. Our growth means that we can make a more positive impact on the world. We're focusing on being great operators and making sure that we're running our business very sustainably. You will see this fact in the fact that we have sourced 100% of our renewable energy for all of our operations, and we are aspiring to be zero waste to landfill by 2020. We're in a strong position, we continue to gain market share, and we will build on that momentum, continuing to spend our money smartly to continue to grow the co-op so that we can continue to serve our community in the outdoors. I'm gonna have Jerry come back up and he's gonna share a bit more about how we're gonna make an impact on the outdoor community. The, uh, the idea of record revenue creates an opportunity for us to have a disproportionate impact. Uh, but as you might imagine, what it means to Build a co-op for the future is very different today. So as we move from 23 members 80 years ago to literally 17 million members, how we go about that is very different today. And I'm gonna share uh, really four stories that begin to talk about how we uh, engage the community, um, how we bring the community focus to the center of our activities, um, and really just, um, I think, illustrate a little bit about the impact your co-op has in supporting our shared passion for the outdoors. I want to start with a story around product sustainability. Uh, this, is, you know, this is reputation for sustainability as something I think that REI has literally a decade-long history in, but this year was a milestone. And published uh, after several years of work with our vendor partner base, a new set of product sustainability standards that will affect thousands of brands sold at REI. Now, we, they'll be fully in effect in the year 2020, but we've been working with our, our vendor partners to put these in place already. So we're making a difference immediately. And it also creates the opportunity for those uh, smaller retailers and those retailers that aren't there yet to kind of have that glide path. And we're really there in position to work with them. Really, this is something that sets the standard. And um, I think there was a quote from one of the national retail uh, folks just for all of retail, even outside the outdoor industry, about the impact of this kind of a statement and what it will mean really through all the apparel industry. 
Uh, it's exciting. It's something we've done with our key partners. I think it's something as an outdoor industry, there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm to embrace. So this idea of, of setting these standards, taking the leadership role, um, and really uh, setting it up in a way that we're there as, as support for our partners is a big step forward and something you can be proud of as we engage uh, our vendor partners who I think are part of that critical com community for the outdoors. Uh, another example is, and we've heard this referred to a couple of times, um, the campaign we had around rallying people to defend our public lands. Uh, REI was literally born on public lands. You know, we're surrounded by national parks. Uh, the love for uh, the climbing, whether it's in the Cascade, the Olympics, or Mount Rainier, uh, literally is, it just it exudes is throughout our entire founding story. In 2017, as this issue came out around the role of public lands, the role it plays in a healthy outdoor life, the importance for access to those public lands, we built a nonpartisan coalition of more than 500 companies to really help mobilize Americans to put this issue front and center around protecting our public lands. We spoke out throughout the course of the year. We invited members and employees to comment uh, about the administration's study or plan to look at shrinking or removing monument protection from 27 of our monuments across the country. The uh, one moment that just sticks in my mind, every year we gather in Salt Lake at an outdoor conference and uh, we chose one evening to really march uh, the entire outdoor industry. There's close to 10,000 people that show up for that conference, uh, marched up to the Capitol steps, um, and really celebrated uh, our love for those public lands, uh, the fact that it was very much a bipartisan uh, effort, that, pub that love doesn't, uh, it's not about a red or a blue leaning, it is just that passion for public lands. Um, so it was a very exciting moment. It was really um, I think a galvanizing moment for the outdoor industry. And I actually believe it was set the stage for, I think, the influence that we have uh, as, a, as, a, as a group of people that care deeply about our outdoors today. This next um, um, step that we took, I think, is, is very dear to my heart. It's, uh, it was proposed by um, a group of women in our company that have a leadership role They've been leading the, the co-op for about a year and a half, looking at everything we do and asking the question, is there a more profound way for us to service women in their pursuit of the outdoors and in their passion for the outdoors? And uh, they came with this idea, can we create a consumer-facing event uh, to really feature and celebrate the role of women in the outdoors? Uh, that work was done, and at last spring, we launched what we call Force of Nature. Uh, really focused on the role of women in the outdoors, but it went beyond that. We looked, at, we looked at gear. What was our gear offering? Did we need to take it to a different place? It looked at extended sizes. But it, even more importantly, we really dug in deep on storytelling, imaging, and quietly, but it went not even necessarily very obviously, over the course of the balance of the year. So from April really through the end of the year, the images we posted were all of women outdoors. The stories we told were about women in the outdoors, written by women. Um, it was just a special moment. It's something that hadn't been done. If you looked at the imaging, images around outdoors, they were, they were very heavily skewed towards men. Um, the response we got was uh, really moving and touching. Um, you know, we, and we let it touch every aspect of what we do. We teach a lot of experiences. Ben talked about 400,000 people outside. In a very proactive manner, we started introducing women-led outdoor classes for women only. The response was overwhelming. Those classes would fill in a day with a 100% with wait list. So just a phenomenal response, um, I think, that was really game-changing. So what I'd like to do is to play the video that really kind of kicked this campaign off. And then at the end of that, we'll come back and do some Q&A. As the nation's largest outdoor company, REI believes that a life outdoors is a life well lived for all people. But we acknowledge that everyone hasn't been equally represented and supported. So the REI Co-op entered into a commitment to ensure that women and girls are just as inspired and equipped to embrace life outside as their male counterparts. 2017 became the year we aspired to make outside the largest level playing field on earth, and a force of nature was born. We put women front and center in everything we did for an entire year and urged people to opt out of cliche gender stereotypes.
These are the voices we've heard our whole lives. But they get harder to hear the further out we go. We put a spotlight on women making brave moves to bring more equality to the outdoor industry and partnered with Outside Magazine on their 40th anniversary issue featuring women icons of the outdoors. We brought the Force of Nature movement to REI stores. The Force of Nature bandana became the physical embodiment of the effort and our community wore it proudly to show their support of equality outdoors. We partnered with unsuspecting influencers and our community followed them as they ventured into the wild. Thousands joined in our outdoor events, classes, and experiences designed to inspire women to get outside. We reached and engaged a younger and more female audience than any previous effort. 2017 was a milestone and a long journey to create access to life outdoors for all. And at the REI Co-op, we remain committed to making the outdoors the largest level playing field on Earth. Let me go ahead and, and, and take the opportunity to wrap us up uh, today. One, I want to reinforce the idea that uh, the opportunity for a Let's Talk is a big part of our culture and has been for a very long time. Um, I can't tell you how profoundly thankful I am to the, to the men and women in this room that have been a part of making REI what it is for 80 years. And for the members in this room that have been a part of the co-op for so long, Again, I want to express my appreciation for your commitment to the co-op, um, your participation as a part of the, of the co-op and that community of people that love the outdoors. Um, we'll always listen. Uh, we'll try to do our best to really kind of represent, stand up for, and advocate for the outdoors, protect the places that we love, and introduce people to the, to the environments and the opportunities that we love. So thank you for being here, and have a good evening. <laughs>